In the midst of Guatemala's civil war in the 1980s, filmmaker Pamela Yates captured shocking footage of the Guatemalan military committing acts of genocide against Mayan civilians. 25 years later, her footage became evidence in an international war crimes case against the former dictator. The film Granito is a follow-up story of destinies joined by Guatemala's past in the quest for justice. Granito was the 2011 premier selection at Sundance Film Festival and will be the final part in American University's Human Rights Film Series. Filmmakers Pamela Yates and Peter Kanoy join us today to discuss their film and its significance for the future of social justice filmmakers. Thank you so much for joining us this evening to talk about your film Granito. So first I just want to talk a little bit about your background. I know that you ran away from home in Pennsylvania at the age of 16, so I was just wondering what motivated that and how that influenced your path as a filmmaker. I wanted to go to the most exciting and dangerous place I had ever heard about, New York City. I think, you know, there are many people in the United States that just don't feel comfortable in small towns. And I wanted to go to a place where I thought things were happening. And New York City seemed to be the place. And it was a very turbulent time in the history of the United States. And I wanted to be a part of the social movements that was making it a turbulent time and, and asking for change. And so that was really the basis for my going to live in New York. Although Peter is a longtime New Yorker. So it was good for us to join forces. So what brought you both to Guatemala in 1982 for the prequel to this film, um, When the Mountains Tremble? Well, I had been working as a sound recordist in Nicaragua and El Salvador during the war there when I heard about the war in Guatemala. And nobody was covering it. It was essentially a hidden war. Um, it was a very difficult war to cover. Guatemalan journalists were being disappeared and censored. And um, it was a particular challenge to try to tell the story. I also knew about the US involvement in Guatemala over decades of supporting military dictatorships that had contributed to the current situation. And the rise of a movement to resist the military dictatorships, I thought would be an important story to tell to the rest of the world. Granito, the, the film that you made after that, has a lot of the same characters as your first film. So, were you in touch with these characters throughout the 30 years, or did you kind of step out of the scene and then re-enter it several years later? Well, Granito, the new film, has some of the same characters, like Rigoberta Menchu, the Nobel Prize winner, Peace Prize winner from, from Guatemala. Some of the people I actually didn't know back in the day, but they were determinant in what we were able to do back in the 1980s. I just didn't know them personally. And so um, re-meeting them was a really interesting, either a, you could say a stroke of luck or a piece of destiny or um, a way to tell a story that had a past and a present and I think a future. Prosecutors asked for your footage as part of evidence in this trial. Instead of just handing over the outtakes, why did you decide to make a first person style documentary to follow up? Well, it wasn't really instead of handing over the outtakes. It was along with mm -hmm. handing over the, and I wouldn't say handing over because we weren't subpoenaed for this information and for the outtakes. Um, lawyers who were um, building a case of genocide against um, these former generals in Guatemala who participated in the slaughter of 200,000 Maya Indians. These, um, the lawyers said, do you have any evidence? We talked with them about, well, what kind of things are you looking for? And then we went back through 25, 30 year old material to see if we could find that, that evidence. It was in doing that that we realized, you know, this would make a really fascinating story about what is the role of documentary in helping to make history. Green is a very unique film because it's a film about a film. So I'd like you just to talk to me a little bit about how you think human rights activism and filmmaking has changed in this new environment that's very globalized and media saturated. 
Well, we have been very privileged to have come of age as filmmakers at the same time or in parallel with the growth of the human rights movement worldwide. And I think that our films have, well, we've benefited from the people in that movement. Often they appear in our films. We get ideas from that movement. And in return, I think we also make films and make stories that the movement can use and can help grow the movement. Um, so the movement has grown tremendously, and that's a very good thing. And I think that they're uh, hungry for more and more stories that really reflect human rights activism and the growth of this movement. When we, when we started um, distributing films, and this would be the early 1980s, and we made films and trying to get them out, we would be really happy if a half a dozen 16 millimeter prints of a film of ours were in circulation. And you compare that to a situation now where you put a film up on the internet, and, and for instance, Granito um, was on the POV website after it was broadcast on, on public television, and tens of thousands of people get to see that film in that, in that way. So the, what we've learned is that we have to figure out new ways to get the information that's in our films out to people and that the theatrical version of the film is not the only version that exists in, in the world. So at this point, we make all different kinds of modules, you know, some very short, some medium length, that, that are used in different circumstances, but all that have the same message as the main film. And we have companion digital media projects for each of the feature length documentary films we do. Because when you go to see a film, if it's a good film, um, you have an emotional experience. You have a kind of a journey of discovery, we hope. And then at the end of the film, you want to do something with that. You want to go someplace with it. And an interactive digital companion piece is definitely the place to go. So we've been developing that with each of our films. And we develop it while we're making the films. And often developing the interactive digital media project informs how we are actually making the film, too. So there's a kind of synergy there that I don't think existed when we first started making films. So how long have you been concurrently making this digital media platform? Since State of Fear, since 2005. So yeah, eight years or so. Mm -hmm. and, and now, as Peter said, we're, you know, we stream our films for free on the internet. So that means that anybody, any place in the world that has decent broadband can see the films. And that's a huge leap over a few 16 millimeter prints in circulation. And the other thing that we've found is that there's such a craving in, in various parts of the world for the kind of documentaries that we're making that the films end up being translated into many, many different languages. And this starts on the international festival circuit, but it goes far beyond that. A film that we made in the, um, well, when, when was State of Fear came out? 2005. 2000, 2005 is now being translated into Arabic. And why is that? Because it deals with a truth commission that happened in Peru. And suddenly, there are people in the Middle East that realize that this form of truth commissions may be useful in helping with the transitions from authoritarian regimes to more open regimes in the area. So suddenly, that, that film has a new life in terms of being translated into, into Arabic. So we, we see our films engaging with different social struggles in ways that we couldn't have expected when we made the film. The story's been developing for decades now. Where does the case stand today? Well, there are two cases. One is in Guatemala, which is the most important case, in my opinion. And um, in January of this year, General Rios Montt, the dictator in How to Nail a Dictator, was indicted on charges of genocide, placed under house arrest, and is being held um, with a high bail. So that trial is meant to begin in the coming months, perhaps next year. 
We'll see how that goes. Um, and in the Spanish case, the Spanish National Court, they also have a warrant for the uh, arrest of General Rios Montt. They want him to be extradited to Spain. But what's really important is that the Guatemalans try General Rios Montt and that justice is done and the recognition of the genocide in Guatemala is brought to the fore. There have been more arrests and convictions in Guatemala in the last three years than in the previous 30 years. So this justice initiative that you see being taken forward by the people in Granito is a really important thing and it's super important for the international community to um, support. What do you want your viewers to walk away with when they see this film? I want them to think about what their granito de arena, their tiny grain of sand is, to contribute to positive social change. Because everybody has one. And in this film, you see a multiplicity of ways of coming at being a human rights defender, whether you're a documentary filmmaker, or a forensic anthropologist, or a lawyer. There are many, many ways. What is my granito de arena? What can I contribute? American University is really excited to show this film today, and I'm sure you'll inspire lots of young filmmakers. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. Oh, Thanks thank a lot. Thank you very much.